everybody, and welcome to another IWAPS. Today we're going to be talking about the effect of Today. Mimi, <laughs> Mimi on pet dog training. The Mimi effect. <laughs> right, Mimi we're going to talk about the Mimi effect. Uh, starting perhaps, I guess, with Mimi the Beagle. You better not uh, tell your mom that this is up. Um, oh no, she'll know. <laughs> I'm sure she'll be very know. excited. Um, well, Mimi the Beagle was in fact named after your mother, Mimi. That How romantic, really. We, well, we had whelping watch. Obviously, we, we knew when they were going to whelp because we knew when fertilization occurred because we mm -hmm. protect that by behavior. So whoever is there at whelping watch and who notices that the whelping is started gets to name the puppies, and we always had a theme. And so the theme was um, professors and um, wives. And so there was uh, Mimi and... They named a puppy after me, they called it SB, but they never explained what it <laughs> meant. Anyway, That's another story. Mimi the puppy. <laughs> um, Mimi was a very big female puppy, enormous, and mm -hmm. just, this is when Sirius was growing up. Sirius was a very, very uh, bellicose, belligerent beagle, fighting with everyone, bullying everyone, puppy. puppy. And one on one, he could take all the puppies out. Mm -hmm. He was like starting as king puppy, even though he was in the, the youngest. Litter. Was he super big? Or just <clears throat> he, he was big, yeah, very big male dog. But Mimi was bigger because she was four weeks older. Mm -hmm. And an incident happened and it taught us so much. I mean, it just changed my whole view on, on behavior and training. Mm -hmm. And basically, Mimi was eating our food. We had food bowls out and the puppies would share, not Sirius. Sirius comes up to the food bowl, as he would do with his litter, stood in it and started growling, the whole bowl's mine. He turns around and growls at Mimi, uh -huh. a very placid beagle, and she exploded. <laughs> I, she went up like a rocket. Uh -huh. And they got into a big fight. All the puppies came in and joined in the fight, even the, you know, the lowest ranking beagle, little tiny Chevy. Chevy? Up, nipped, <laughs> nipped, <laughs> serious on Look the Look out, here comes Chevy! <laughs> then the adult dogs formed a circle watching this. Huh. Seriously? Yeah, I'm oh, serious. Seriously? That's very funny. <laughs> and then the fight stopped. And a number of things happened, and it taught me so much. Number one, Sirius's entire temperament was different from that day on. He became a very low-key, pleasant, friendly beagle. So the notion that temperament could change. A powerful experience could change. Temperament was meant to be written in stone. Yeah. Your behavior can change, but not temperament. And here we see a dog having a temperament makeover, a bump, like this. <laughs> nice. And so that's why temperament training became part of the triad. Mm -hmm. Obedience training, behavior training, and temperament training is what we do in, in Sirius. All right, Mimi and the temperament makeover. The second thing was I thought, wow, Sirius could take on any beagle individually. Uh -huh. He can deal with the group of puppies. The power so of why the pack. The why did that work? Power of the pack. the pack. Yeah, and so what we developed then that alongside that Hind was doing similar stuff with other animals in England, Robert Hind, we realized you have individuals, you have interactions, you have groups and it develops a culture, a group culture. And now any puppy coming into this is, there's no contest, he learns the culture. Right. And this is what maintains group harmony. So this was, was really cool, that um, the puppies just said, Sirius, quit it. Mm -hmm. So no, one puppy couldn't do it, even James. Sirius would beat him up. But even as a James. group, even James. <laughs> Who, James, no, James is no meanie. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> Jamie was named after James the puppy. <laughs> so Mimi the beagle was named after Mimi the person. Right. You, you the person named after the puppy. Well, I'm honored. The third thing we learned from this was, I mean, why did Mimi blow up? I mean, she was a pretty friendly, placid beagle. So we went back through the records and we realized over the past three weeks, everything Sirius had been doing was just annoying Mimi. Mm -hmm. He would steal her bone, he would push her out of the sunlight, she had to lie in the shade. And, and this is, these are objective records you had of oh, yeah. recording all of these things. everything. Huh. And all of these things, and then I think the food bowl was like the last straw that broke the camel's back. Now, at the time I was teaching, um, well, I, I was accepting bike cases um, mm -hmm. to, I was studying aggression, but also I was working with dogs that bit people. And, and some of these cases were really confusing, and then all of a sudden it made sense that the medical model does not apply to biting. That's it's, important. That's an important oh, it's piece. so important. Well, this, well, sometimes it's not. 
you know, yeah. the, 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 if you have a lot of degrees after your name and a dog bites someone, you're looking for one cause. You classify aggression. But in behavior, it's totally different. In mm -hmm. behavior, you have many causes and one Versus behavior, if the you bite. you have a, a physical symptom, there's usually one cause. For usually one symptom. cause for many for clinical signs. It's the other, yeah, the other way around. And so now, Which you is see, important because so many people oh, come in and say, he bit me out of the blue or, you know. Without you know, warning, no without warning, reason. No well, reason. Let, let, me, let me list the reasons. Yeah. He, you know, he takes a while to warn to strangers. You know, he, he's a bit tricky around his food bowl. He's not overly fond of children. He's hand shy. And he's having a bad hair day. He woke up this morning and his hips hurt. There's five reasons mm -hmm. that put him on edge. But not, none of those reasons may be sufficient to cause him to bite alone. It's when they all come together and the last straw breaks the camel's back. So now this made biting, biting people, predictable, understandable, mm -hmm. preventable, and treatable. Because you can treat and desensitize each of these cues Absolutely. at the same time. So that's huge. Uh, for all of this from Mimi and Sirius. Yeah. yeah. Pretty, oh, pretty cool. Although, so, actually, now that you mention that, it, it does seem like perhaps there are some places in the medical model where that kind of approach would make a lot of sense, where there are things where you have a variety of combinations. You know, you have stress, lack of sleep, diet, yeah. lack of exercise, and all these things manifest and start to yeah, Doctors uh, are just starting to get up. Right, so they're, they're, they're about to catch up with <laughs> behaviors <laughs> and the dog yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Because it is confusing if you're looking for one cause and say somebody has um, an infection and a cancer. It's going to give you a confusing set of clinical signs. But as a behaviorist, you're used to this all the time because we're always looking for multiple causes. Right. Well, not to get to medical advice. I didn't want to hear yeah. whether <laughs> Mimi the person had any impact as well on our uh, Interestingly, yes, that we come from different ends of the spectrum. We, you and me. Mimi and I, from looking at behavior. I'm a strict behaviorist, or used to be. Um, she's a cognitive psychologist. Mm -hmm. And so, all along the line, in terms of uh, puppy raising, our first puppy, um, who happened the same time as the advent of puppy classes. You know, uh, Omaha, my first puppy, was in the second puppy class I right. taught. Um, child raising. We would approach it differently. So, for example, puppy crying, child crying when you put them to bed. Mm -hmm. The behaviorist says, well, you can't go in there and comfort them because that would reward them for crying. Mm -hmm. Cognitive psychologist says, you better get in there and comfort them right away because you have They're to care for a good reason. reason. So we had these lovely discussions mm -hmm. and it, it really changed the way that I taught. It, it, like the understanding the dog's point of view principle. You've got to take into account the dog's needs. Right. The other thing that Mimi has, I'm sure you're aware, is a steel trap, clinical, objective, super sharp mind. Mm -hmm. And she had a way of asking questions that would solve the problem. Mm. So there was once, I remember I'll give one example, we are skiing, you and I, you're two and a half years old, you're being a bit of a pain, well, no, whatever, you're probably too young Me for too. this. You're, uh, being you're being two and a half. You're right. So I think, oh, let's go back. a bit of a pain. So the, the idea was we were going to go seven miles in and then we're going to get in the sled and Omaha's going to pull us down. And um, anyway, putting your skis on and off and what have you, so cut a long story short, short. I said, let's go back to the cabin and see what Mimi was doing. So I put you in the sled hook up Omaha, put him in his harness, I get him the sled, so like, go on Omaha, pull. Mm -hmm. And he just stands there. And I'm like, Omaha, pull. And you're going, yeah. Omaha, pull. Like this, so said, Omaha, pull. Great Malamute who's supposed to you know, pull the sled. Yeah. It's in his blood. So then I, then I, I commit sledders, sledders number one crime. I get out of the sled. Sledders crime. And I go up and I said, what is your problem? What part of pull don't you understand? He takes off with you in the sled. <laughs> oh my God, no. So I tell him, sit. I'm going to sit. Uh -huh. Bam. The sled hits him in the butt. Off he goes again. <laughs> Eventually steady. He said, anyway, I, I healed him back. You sat in the sled. You were enjoying all this. And we went back to the cabin. And Mimi says, well, how'd it go, guys? And I said, well, Omaha wouldn't pull the sled. And she doesn't even turn around. She's cooking lunch. And she said, if you told him to pull on cue, I said, no. She said, why? I said, well, because he's a Malamute, and that's what they do. And she said, I would teach him to pull on cue if I were you. <laughs> if you want him to pull on cue. Yeah, right. and, and, and this is the massive, the huge pre segment of my science-based dog training lecture. 
when you look at a behaviour problem, pulling on leash, jumping up or barking, you could define it as a high frequency behaviour. Mm -hmm. Which means if you teach the dog, if you follow a low frequency behaviour, i.e. the solution to a problem, or what we call a dog problem, but the dog calls no problem at all, this is my hobby, mm -hmm. a high frequency behaviour, if we go walk by my side, pull, walk by my side, pull, now the problem, because you put it on cue, can be used as a reward to reinforce the solution. Right. So r right out of that came now these eight problems we put on cue to motivate a dog to come when called and mm -hmm. to sit. And really it's just all dog training in general. What she was what, what she was talking about is, you know, all dogs sit, all dogs lie down, all dogs do most of the behaviors that we ask them to do. Um, when they on, want, yeah. but do they do it when you want them to? Do and, they understand what your request mm -hmm. is and yeah. have you taught them to do it on cue? So and, that's and an important I think, problem. yeah, this is one of the biggest... But you weren't a dog trainer yet, really? No, not mm -hmm. really. Really, no? Well, well. You, you often say I'm not a dog trainer I'm now. A, <laughs> so out of your mouth, that one. <laughs> There's only one dog <laughs> trainer in this house. All right, we should wrap up. All right, let's end on that note. We should wrap up. All right, so the Mimi effect, I like that. I'm saying goodbye now. Yes. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>